Okay, everybody, um, I'm back. I decided to do a little bit of a bonus um, video. This one is for live acquisition. So live data is collected, um, is mostly collected on within the incident response investigation. However, will also be collected during search warrants and other digital forensic scenarios. The main purpose of, for acquiring the evidence live is to preserve the volatile data that can be further investigated. Live acquisitions and data analysis can help answer investigation questions quickly and determine data, data loss, negative impact um, on, uh, of an incident or um, device relevance to the investigation. It's ideal to, to perform live acquisitions to not only collect the volatile data, but also the logs and file listings that can help you determine if you should continue to conduct a full disk image. Um, so there are a couple of risks of, of doing a live acquisition a collection process that has a risk of making changes in the system. Uh, so live acquisition can put the device at risk due to possible changes of the files of the system during the collection process. So it's recommended to use an automated process to mitigate the risks. Um, the risks of a live acquisition is business disruption. For example, um, if it slows down the machines, uh, destroying evidence. Um, essentially, if you don't have a proper tool or proper uh, automated process, it can uh, manipulate or change evidence that you're trying to acquire, uh, alerting an attacker. So if it isn't automated and there's an attacker in there uh, and you're rummaging through and doing your collections there, um, an, an attacker can be alerted of the activity that's being performed on the system. And then system crashes or blue screen of death. Uh, I have seen it in live acquisitions, uh, some uh, automated tools and home tools, and also uh, some paid tools have caused blue screens of death when performing live, live acquisitions, which is not fun because then you lose all of the volatile data and that you're trying to so patiently trying to preserve. So when you're conducting a live acquisition, um, there are no processes that allow an examiner analyst to interact with the system without making any changes to it. So the moment you plug in a USB into the machine, hit a key and start a process, these actions will modify the system. So changes are unavoidable in a live acquisition. So the most important part is to only make changes that you intend to do and document them. So reason to believe uh, volatile data contains the information critical to investigation is one of the reasons when you should conduct a live acquisition. Another one is the acquisition can run in an ideal manner, minimizing changes to the target system. Numerous systems are affected, making forensic imaging unfeasible. So if you have 30 machines that are being affected, you're not going to want to do a full disk image of all 30 machines. You're going to want to do a triage to see which one has the most information that will lead you to the direction of the initial compromise or even the point of entry, hopefully, maybe. Uh, a short timeline. So triaging or completing live acquisitions can help you triage the system a lot faster and easier. And then legal considerations that make it a recommendation, recommended action to ensure as much data is preserved. So people, some people will do a live acquisition first, uh, triage it, and then perform a uh, full disk image afterwards in order to preserve all types of information as much data as possible. There are some dra drawbacks. So uh, the target system could be sensitive to performance issues. Uh, if the system was already you know, bogged down by a lot of applications, by a lot of usage, et cetera, doing a live acquisition is just going to make it worse. Um, the failure of the system could impact the investigation. So those blue screens of desks are super pesky. The target system might not have undergone testing to ensure the tools are compatible. So if you have to do a live acquisition, you've never done one on a, let's say, Windows 11, you don't know if your tools are going to be compatible or how they're going to affect them, it is very recommended to do a testing within the, within the lab and verify the results that you are receiving and also ensure that all your tools are uh, working properly on the operating system. And of course, approval is recommended. Next, uh, we want to select tool. So um, acceptability 
improves the consideration in many areas. Should the tool you choose not be generally accepted in the forensic community, you will increase the risk of your findings being disputed. Um, these findings can be logging, chain of custody, cryptographic checksums, procedures, and algorithms. Um, number two, you should consider, you should have live response tools that address all common systems that are used in your environment, Windows, Linux, Apple, and more. Uh, three, collect data that will uh, most likely help answer common questions and provide leads. Uh, don't collect items that you don't need to collect. So if you're not doing a, if you are specifically doing a malware investigation, you don't necessarily need to collect the pictures or the videos of, of, um, of the operating system. Um, you should probably be focusing on other items. Um, anything that's less than an hour on average is a good goal. We don't want to be sitting there waiting for, let's say, six hours for an acquisition to be completed, only to find out that it's useless, that there's no data on there. Um, it's a waste of time. Um, ensure that you're able to add or remove items to collect based on your needs of the investigation. So something that has the abilities to either remove some lines of code within your automation, or if you're using a paid uh, tool, you can deselect items that you don't need to collect. Um, and then ensure your tools can provide both structured data and raw data. Make sure that if it is structured data, that uh, it is parsed properly, that you can read it properly. And if it's raw data, make sure that that raw data is compatible with other operating systems or other tools that you can use to, to, to parse that data. So what do you collect? Um, well, the first category is the current running state of the system. So what is happening now? Typical system memory contents will help in answering the question as to what is happening now. This is considered volatile data. So your network connections, your running processes are super um, important to collect. And then you have the second category, which what happened in the past? Because digital forensics is all about what happened and not what is going to happen. Um, so, uh, this information is typically less volatile and provides data for what happened to the system in the past. We should continue to evaluate what to collect while conducting the investigation. So you should also consider the circumstances of the ongoing incident. For example, for malware infection, there would be no justification to performing an extensive data collection. However, it might be important to capture the entire contents of memory. Uh, and for the second category, snapshot data, such as file listings, operating system logs, which would be your event logs as well, and the operating system data and application data. Um, so one activity that we can do um, as a group or as an individual, or just think about it, uh, would be to describe your established collection protocol. So what would you do if you were given a system, let's say you're working in a, in a digital forensics lab and you're given a system, what would be your established protocol to collect from that system? Um, I will answer that in another video. Um, but you should take some time to think about it. Go over all of the other videos that I, ha I have done and it might give you some ideas. And then of course, um, the tools that are available for you in a digital forensic lab, um, you can use pre-built toolkits or create your own scripts or use hybrid methods. You can use open source or paid sources. You can use a mix of the two. You can use whatever you need to do in order to get the results that you need, but also verify those results when you do get them. Um, there are some links that I can provide to you, which uh, one of them is awesome. DFIR.com has a really cool DFIR tooling. Um, it lists a lot of the open source and tested and validated tools that you can use and create a pre-built toolkit for yourself. Well, I hope everybody enjoyed this short video. It is a bonus video, um, but uh, the next video I promise is going to be about mobile acquisitions. And I hope to see you there. Bye.